I don't think I have to do a lot of introductions. This panel speaks for itself. We did have a question in the previous panel about pets. How do pets live in a tiny house? And I think you guys are probably going to address some of those issues, right? Let's see, I see a little pet right here right in the middle. <laughs> so I want to introduce Blair Belt, Jason Clark, Nika Fotopoulos, and Mike Iacona. And they're going to talk about in compromising positions, how to live in a tiny house with your partner. So I'm going to hand off the microphone, just pass it around. Thank you. Uh, hi. Yes, yeah, so my name is Mike Iacona, and um, my wife, Nika, and I have lived in our tiny house for about five years. Uh, we built it ourselves, and mainly because we knew we wanted to buy land at some point, but we didn't have the land. And so we built a tiny house, knowing we'd move it around, looking for land, and eventually we did find land, and so now our tiny house is on our land that we've bought. So it's worked really well for us for that purpose. Um, and we welcomed Ella into our tiny house as well. Um, she's three and a half, presently. Um, so maybe I'll just pass it down, we can introduce ourselves and then get into the more meat of the discussion. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jason. Blair. I'm Blair. And uh, we moved into our tiny house uh, January 2nd, 2016, and uh, lived in it through August of that year. And uh, now we're in plans of renovating and getting back into it full time. But um, yeah, traveled with it from Colorado to Dallas to North Carolina and then up to Vermont. So. Uh, that's our background in tiny houses. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this along. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so we're here to talk about how to live in a compromising space with your partner. Um, how big is your tiny house? 175. 175 square feet. Jason and I lived in 100 square feet. And um, um, we have the two opposite ends of the spectrum. These guys have a little itty bitty kid and we have two very rambunctious dogs. And sometimes um, living with all of that in such a small space can be overwhelming. Um, I think that uh, the, the root of how to live in a tiny space with your partner, and correct me if I'm wrong, would be to have a good communication with your partner. Um, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, me and my partner want to live in a tiny house, but we don't communicate and actually hate each other and sometimes want to kill each other. And if I just could squeeze their head sometimes, that would be great. Jason and I have those moments from time to time, but you have to work through that. Um, you have to be like, okay, we're having an argument. We're clearly disagreeing with each other. And how are we going to get out of this? Where as a couple who lives in a five bedroom house could just slam the door and walk down the hallway and be like, I'm going to my room and I'm not talking to you. Uh, I distinctly remember one, one night, Jason and I got into a very heated discussion and it's raining and where are you going to go? He turned around and I sat this way and we were really quiet for about five minutes. And then we're like, okay, are you ready to talk? Because we have to talk because no one's slamming a door here. We don't have any doors in our house. Um, so I think the, the key component to like living in a compromising situation is having an open communication with your partner. Right? Am I right? Is, is, is um, um, being transparent with them and being like, okay, we're disagreeing, but we have to talk about this and never leaving a situation angry. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you <laughs> either of you uh, yes, want to add to uh, that? <laughs> um, so I'm Mika, and um, I think for us, at least having a family in a tiny house um, has led us to um, explore the larger space that is our home, which is also the outside space. Um, I feel like living in a tiny home Three, like three seasons of the year, you know, we're just outside so much, um, you know, whether it's eating, whether it's, well, we haven't, like our bathroom is not in the house or outhouse. Um, and uh, yeah, we just try and like utilize the outside space as much as possible. Um, and then comes winter. <laughs> um, 
and once we're kind of cooped up and kind of on top of each other, um, I feel that we, as Blair said, you know, communication is key, but also um, just being, like I, I've noticed with like Mike and I, and Ella too, because she's been raised in that way, is like, I can almost like sense his his bubble of space, you know, if he's coming near me, like, I just automatically move, you know, he doesn't have to be like, hey, Mika, can you get out of the way? You know, it's sort of like, um, uh, you start to read the other person's, like, body language um, to a point where you don't have to always use words, and it just happens in its own way. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> uh, I'd like to add on that, yeah, winter is definitely the most challenging time, it's like, you know, people talk about cabin fever a lot, but like when you're in a tiny house with two other people, it's like ultra cabin fever, you know, in like March. But we spend a lot of time outside in the summertime, and um, as far as, you know, Ella's, it's her only home that she's ever known, and it's she's fine with it. In the wintertime, it's kind of crazy. She'll, we have like one long hallway in the middle of our tiny house, and she just kind of runs up and back and forth up the hallway <laughs> with her toys or whatever, like has her... Yeah, we have a wood stove on one side of the tiny house. Um, and so she's very, she's never been burned by the wood stove. She's very aware of it. And um, she just learned about that at a very early age. But I would think it might be more challenging. Like if there was a family who lived in a larger house and then was downsizing into a tiny house, that might be really challenging for kids. Um, but it's all she's never known. She never complains that her house is too small. So that's kind of nice. <laughs> um, for the picture, oh, sorry. I don't have to project so much. Uh, for the first six months that we lived in our tiny house, we were really lucky because we were on the road. Um, we left Colorado and we had been saving our money for over a year for this very reason, is to quit our jobs and let go for a little bit. Um, so the first six months for us were, it was definitely a, a challenge and it was new first moving into the tiny house because we went from 2,100 square feet to 100. Um, and one of the main things we hear when people are like, oh, I love the tiny houses, but I have too much stuff. It's like, yeah, we had all that stuff too. It's just stuff though. Um, you can get rid of it. That's where a lot of our travel money came from is we sold all of our stuff. Um, so those first six months on the road when we were traveling and just spending two weeks, three weeks in different campgrounds or different locations or you know, a friend's ranch down in Texas, that was really wonderful because we were changing location all the time. We didn't have to worry about the day in, day out, nine to five, getting ready for work, being presentable. Um, but then once we were here in town where we knew we were staying for a while and we got our jobs again, um, it became much more difficult to get back into that routine of, I can't smell like campfire and I have to look presentable today. So I need to, to get myself in order. So that part was also then another learning curve after we'd been in the house for a while. Um, but like, um, like everybody's been saying, I think one of the biggest uh, biggest challenges for us to adapt to was that there there is no place to hide. Like you can't go shut yourself in your craft room or your your garage or whatever it is you had your give your getaway point. Like you had to confront things head on. You had to hash things out if there was a problem. Um, and one of the rules we made in our house is that we never go to sleep angry. Like if there was a problem, we'd talk it out until we we're able to come to a conclusion and then go to sleep. Um, so that was one of our biggest things, was just to make sure you talk it out, don't go to bed angry. That was one of our number one rules. Um, yeah? Uh, something I wanna add is after we moved out of our 100 square foot tiny house, we moved into a 400 square foot tiny house. So we like upgraded, it felt like a mansion. Um, when we were living there, it was like, we, we, have, the, we have the same, Kind of non-verbal communication of like okay I know that the bathroom is this small and if I'm brushing my teeth and Jason's brushing his teeth I can't hog the sink like you start reading each other and you're like okay well I know he's getting in for bed so I'm gonna like kind of brush my teeth to side and like you you make space for each other I think that's the a big issue that people don't don't do is like I have to make space for my stuff and I have to make space for the dogs and Yes, do that, but also remember that you're sharing this space with another person. So you have to make space and, and re, you know, remember that you're cohabitating. It's all, it, everything that like goes back around cohabitating and, and um, if he's having a bad day, like 
his energy is going to bounce around that 100 or 400 square foot space and eventually hit me again, and I'm going to go into the bad bad day. But if I choose to 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 share the space with him and he chooses to share the space with me, like you can turn that energy and flip it back around and, and have a great day. Um, we could talk. You know, uh, sometimes you have a partner who's really messy and um, is super disorganized. I'm highly ADHD. I'll bounce around. I leave stuff everywhere. And Jason's like, I'm just going to put this back and I'm going to put this back. And like, oh. yeah, I'm just like a, I'm just like a three year old. Um, and um, sometimes that drives your partner crazy. There are times where we get at each other because I have left a mess. And, and Mr. Tidy over here is constantly cleaning it up. Um, but, but that goes into like the cohabitating thing of like, okay, I love you because you are the way you are and we live in a tiny house, so I'm just, I'm just gonna clean it up. And then you also change your habits. I have habitually been a messier person and I am learning to pick up after myself. <laughs> so, so, you know, you adapt to your, your environment and you change. I guess um, just riffing off of that, I think um, Ella, having grown up in a tiny house, um, she, like one of our rules is she can't have more than one thing that she's playing with out at a time. And obviously at first she would protest and, or she was too young to even like use words, she would just kind of do it and I would tell her to not do it. <laughs> do you want to say something? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now that she's three and a half, she actually does it. And she, you know, she understands that like, um, you know, space is uh, a, a shared uh, thing and therefore we have to respect each other to take care of that space. Um, and so, yeah, I feel really grateful that that's something she's learning at such a young age because of like our situation. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is, um, yeah, we, so our tiny house, um, it's really not designed with a lot of like privacy spaces. Um, so it just means that like our family is very comfortable with each other in all situations, whether it's getting changed, whether it's taking a shower, whether it's, um, yeah, it's just sort of like, um, I think in this culture, there's such a, um, there's a lot of emphasis on privacy in people's lives, and I think living at a tiny house, you kind of strip that away and get used to just being out in the open with your partner and, you know, your child, or sometimes you have a guest over and it's a little awkward, but, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I really appreciate that. A lot of times, you know, I wonder if, when, if at some point in time we're not living in a tiny house, if I'm going to really miss the times of living in a tiny house. I'm sure that there are things I'm going to miss um, if that day comes. Um, but one thing I appreciate about tiny houses is the fact that they're so small that it's really easy to reach the point of it's too messy in here, but then it only takes like 15, 20 minutes to clean everything up. Whereas like the other bigger houses I've lived in, you could take all day to clean the house. So it, that's a really nice feature. Um, and I think another challenging aspect of living in a tiny house is having friends over, especially in the winter time. It's like, if we want to have people over, it's like, as you all have experienced, I'm sure, going into these tiny houses with 20 other people that you don't even know, it gets crowded in there really fast. So it's kind of challenging to like invite friends over or multiple, you know, have a party, especially in the winter time. And summertime, it's not so bad because you could be outside, but. Um, especially little ones that want to <laughs> And if the friends have kids that bring their kids over and they all want to play with the toys, it's really, it's hard to move around. But you know, we find ways to work around it. And I think initially there was a lot of awkwardness on my end of, I think on one part, living with Nika in such a small space, but I got over that really quickly. But then like having guests over, like Nika's parents would come to visit and like sleep on our day bed and you know, just like walking around in my boxers and changing in front of them was a little bit awkward at first, but now it's like, you know, we just do it and we're all used to it. <laughs> But they only come maybe once or twice a year, so it's not like they're... I was going to say, it's a great deterrent for the Yeah, Amazon. that's true, yeah. They definitely probably come more if we had a bigger house. That's pretty funny, isn't it?
She doesn't have her own room. We co-sleep, so we have a loft space where the three of us sleep in a queen-size bed, which is kind of tight. Um, but we make it work. Um, and yeah, you know, she's got like her zones of the house. You know, like she's got her drawers and she's got her like bookshelf and she's got um, a little space where she has like some toys. But it's it's not. You know, most kids have way more toys than she has. Um, so we definitely are. Um, minimal in her use of <laughs> in her use of toys, but it's also part of our ethic with her is like not wanting to shower her with toys and stuff, um, and instead like everything can be a toy or something to learn from. Um, so that's kind of you know she loves cooking, you know like there's I don't know, yeah. <laughs> what about as she gets older? Like you have like a like, you know she's gonna cook with you, but like right. eventually. She's Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so we so we built this tiny house as a home to move on to raw land, um, and so now we've been on the land for three years, and we've been um, slowly building a larger home that um, we will move into once that's done. But it'll be you know we're, we'll sell our tiny house, which will be kind of sad. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so we don't plan on raising her into adulthood in our tiny house. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, go ahead. I'm just curious, like, maybe we have a show of hands. Are people that, do you come to a tiny house fest because you're really serious about wanting to live in a tiny house? Like, is there any kind of show of hands of people that are really serious about living in a tiny house? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah. And you do live in a tiny house, so it's people that, yeah. And I think that if the whole kind of movement has gained a lot of popularity through television, you know, every time we meet somebody and tell them I live in a tiny house, they're like, oh, just like on TV. <laughs> I've never actually seen the TV show, so I don't even know, but maybe. Um, so, well, that's, I think that's really cool that there are a lot of people that are interested in living in a tiny house, and it's, it's great, like, I really like it. I think if we, if we didn't have a child and we're thinking about having another child, we would probably not be building another house. We are building a passive solar, super insulated house. Um, I just want to piggyback on, on, I don't have children, but I know a lot of people who live in a tiny house that do have children. Um, I'm, we're with the little school bus, and so I, we're pretty invested in the schooly community, which is living in a school bus as, as your house. And I follow this woman, I've never met her, I follow her on Instagram like the millennial that I am. And um, she is a single mom, she's got five kids and two huskies. She lives in Florida in a 40 foot school bus. She's lived in this house for five years and she plans on raising the rest of her kids in that house. And so if you're, if you're a young couple thinking that, to have kids, like plan your house with that in mind. Like if you if you want to raise a kid in a tiny house, you can. If you want to have a bigger family and move on to a bigger house, that's also fine. It's your life, and you you choose to live it the way you do. But if 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 wanting to have a bigger family is keeping you from living in a tiny house, don't let that stop you. Think about your future and then plan your tiny house. This woman had five kids and then moved into a tiny house and has no no plan on turning around. You know. So if that's something that you want to do, like, like, put it on your goal list and manifest your destiny. You know, and I just thought that should be said. A lot of people are like, I don't, I don't want to, I want to live in a tiny house, but I also have two dogs and three cats, and and uh, I'm pregnant, and like, you can do it if you want to. You can also live in a bigger house if you want to, but don't let that stop you from doing something that you want to do. Yes. You talked about going from like a 2100 square foot to a what, 200 or something like that. How, how has that affected your accumulation of things? And to, how has that been? You like to take this one? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> It has changed everything. Um, I used to be the guy that, wandering through antique stores or thrift stores, I would just buy stuff because I thought it was cool. And eventually I'll use it. Um, and we've completely had to change that. When we were first moving into the bus, the hardest problem was we have 
way too much stuff, stuff that I thought was really important to me that I, I couldn't imagine getting rid of, like my, my Lego collection, which... <laughs> um, but it ultimately, after a few months, that's all it really is, it's just stuff. Like, I can't even tell you what half of the things were that we got rid of. Um, we had a huge yard sale of things that were nice things, nice furniture, nice clothes, stuff that, you know, I had never planned on getting rid of when I bought it, but now couldn't even tell you what half of that stuff was. Um, and now through living in a tiny house, we found that we, we try to have, not in a pretentious way, but we try to have the nicer of the things. Like if you're gonna buy a pair of shoes, buy a really nice pair of shoes that's gonna last you. And you've got that one pair of shoes, like your, your casual shoes and then your, your nice shoes. And that's, that's really about it. Um, and then here in Vermont, your winter boots. But uh, like when we buy clothes, we, we always ask each other, hey, is this something that you want or do you really need this? Or do you have something at home that you're gonna trade this out with? Is another thing that we do. When you wanna buy something, you have to kind of make the space for it to come into the, the place. Like I'm not nearly as compulsive with buying things as I used to, um, like Legos. Um, we, we always counsel with each other before anything gets brought into the house, um, unless it's groceries. And then, um, even then, and really prioritizing, you know, what is really important to me in my life right now, because also knowing the society that we live in, in the next couple of years, there's going to be, if not just that year, there's going to be a better version of that thing that you have. And chances are you're going to want that nicer one eventually. So we always just break it into that of perspective of a there's always another one of this thing that you have unless it's like some family heirloom then yeah you should probably keep that but um yeah i, I guess the, one of the hardest obstacles that we come across is people saying i've got too much stuff that i really love and i can't get rid of it and i would just encourage you if that's your fear get rid of it because that stuff owns you more than you own it so um and chances are you won't even remember what it is down the road I just wanted to say a quick thing about the financial aspect of tiny houses. Um, you know, a lot of the tiny houses here or anywhere that you see online, Craigslist, whatnot, the companies that make them are, you know, they're pretty expensive. They're not really cheap. Like 70 grand is a normal price you'll see for a tiny house. But like, we, I think we spent $13,000 on the materials for our tiny house, including the trailer. So, you know, there is a lot of labor that goes into it. So a lot of the money, if you're buying one from a company, goes towards labor, but just want to, throw out there that if you have inclinations of you know doing things on your own you know you, you don't have to do everything like hire somebody to do the electrical or the plumbing or um, you know pay somebody to consult on an hourly basis to explain how to do something YouTube is an incredible asset I don't know what I did without YouTube it's like I've learned so much stuff on YouTube um, but just to say that you know we spent about 13 to 15 thousand on the materials for our tiny house and it's I think it's really beautiful and it's been a great house for us so you don't have to spend 60, 70 grand to get a tiny house. Yeah? Um, I'm going to be speaking at 4.30, so hopefully some people will stay. I have a village in Iowa, and so we have five different kinds of homes that we built there, and more coming. And we just moved a couple into the toddlers to try out the tiny house and walk. We know they're not going to want it, but to try out the village living. And then they're selecting where they want to live on the site and how to build it to fit that site and fit their family. I think trying out is very important. We also offer Airbnbs for people to try them ahead of time that way. And uh, totally respect, everybody goes a different way. You know, and I think you're going for energy efficiency, and that's a hard one in winterized areas for tiny houses on trailers. So that's but it's such a small space, you don't need a lot of energy to heat them. Yeah. I mean, we bought pretty much the smallest wood stove we could find, and that thing cooks us out sometimes. Ours cooks us out too. Yeah. Especially because we sleep in a lot. We sleep in a lot, yeah. Any other questions? Anybody got a question? Yeah. I mean, overall, I think the tiny house movement is, is awesome. It's, in a lot of ways, giving people a sense of freedom. You know, you can get away from paying rent. You can build a house relatively inexpensively. And it depends town by town what the regulations are as far as having your tiny house parked at another house or in a piece of land or something, so you gotta figure that out, but I think it creates a lot of freedom for people to uh, really live on less money, which creates space and gives you more freedom not having to maybe work full time or... And connection. And connection to your other, yeah, loved ones and... Yeah, yeah go ahead. Can you put a tiny house on a property in New Jersey? 
Uh, it's really town by town, or the uh, regulation, so you, I, I would suggest that you get in touch with the town office, um, yeah, and then ask them what their policies are. I always recommend to people to maybe not say, hey, I wanna put a tiny house on this piece of land, but don't show them all your cards. Say like, hey, what's the regulations around you know, having an RV in my land? Because RVs, everybody knows what an RV is, and most people don't really know what a tiny house is, so say it's on wheels, it's temporary, there might be a difference between living in it full time and just having it there and using it as an Airbnb or having your in-laws or relatives come and stay in it. There's a, and there's also some leeway in that. You could tell them that your in-laws are staying in it you know, two times a year and maybe somebody's living there full time. You, know, you might be able to get away with that. But it depends town by town. And also depends how much the property is able to be seen. You know, if it's set back away from the road and people can't really see it, you can probably get away with more than if it's right on a road. Usually, yeah, foundation means you gotta get a permit. If you know, it's town by town, but like 120 square feet, 200 square feet, something like that is usually a... Um... Depends on how dirty you wanna roll. <laughs> yeah, depends on it out, yeah. If you wanna just sneak how it under the radar. How are you with the law? That's what you have. <laughs> right. Okay, this is an amazing panel. I think we all have to give you a lot of respect for doing what you wanted to do. Thank you so much.